You guys ready to worship? Okay, we are. I'm sure you are. Let's stand up and worship. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs. Against the twist and the battle belongs to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness Spirit to come. Father, we thank you that you're with us, and we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and have your way in our lives today, have your way in this place today. Amen. Speak to each one of our hearts. As we give you praise and glory this morning, Lord, we offer our, our songs to you, we offer our praise to you as a thanksgiving. We come into your courts with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise, and we thank you, Lord, today that we're here and that we just invite you to take over now everything that's done here today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Oh, Lord. 
few announcements we'd like to share with you guys this morning. I can see everybody. Praise God. What a glorious day. Amen. 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 Uh, we want to welcome each and every one of you today to the house of the Lord. It's wonderful to see everyone here, to get together, to worship, and learn, and fellowship one with another. So uh, grab your bulletins, happenings this week. We do have our uh, prayer meeting Wednesday, 10 a.m., okay? And uh, here at the church, Wednesday, 10 a.m., very important to pray. And if you can't make it, just pray wherever you are. That's a good thing. And um, then upcoming, this Friday is Good Friday. And we are going to have a Good Friday service here at the church. So if you can make it, that would be awesome. Six o'clock here at the church, a Good Friday service this Friday. And uh, let's see, there's no youth group this coming Saturday because we're having our um, Easter celebration with all the children and the parents are supposed to be bringing their kids. So if you know neighbors uh, that have children, tell them we're having an Easter egg hunt and we're doing the resurrection story, the true story. So this is a time of evangelism for the parents and the children. So it's a wonderful experience. And thank you for everyone who helped stuff the uh, plastic eggs. There's only how many thousands of them? <laughs> There's a lot. Okay, so uh, that is at 11 o'clock this coming Saturday here at the church on the play, playground area, well, right here, outside. Okay, and then, of course, next Sunday is Resurrection Day. Amen. Praise God, he is risen, so we're going to celebrate risen that. Indeed. Amen, risen indeed, and we have special music and everything, so that'll be exciting. And um, let me see, what else? I had these as a reminder for something. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, we sent out news, uh, church newsletters. So, but some of you, I don't have your addresses, so I have the letters over here. But if you would like to give us your name and mailing address, then we can get it to you. So I've got some of these over there, too. No, no good news club this week either. No, nope. not on Friday. Okay. Lots going on this week. So we'll, they'll start back up in April. So that's good. And it will be on Fridays from 4 to 5. Yes, Miss Lee. Uh, we are having Kevin Friday this week. Oh, okay, that's Thursday and Friday? Yes. Okay, 10 to 12. Yes. Heaven's Garden, that's for the younger children. Okay, <coughs> awesome. And, um, and then this evening, you can be praying for us, uh, Ron and I and Joseph. And Robert's coming too, and Scott's coming. We're going to be at the Gospel Mission. Uh, for their evening service, so just pray that if there's people there that don't know Jesus, they'll come to know him as their personal savior, so it's a wonderful time to to uh, tell the good news there. All right, that's in Klamath Falls. All right, now what else is happening that I'm forgetting about? Yes, uh, Robert? Men's uh, breakfast is Saturday at 8.30. That's right. So, okay. Uh, if you're late, come and you do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so men's men's breakfast this Saturday at eight thirty at here at the church. So come and fellowship, all you men. Okay, I forgot about that, and I think that's um, all the announcements that I know of. Okay. Dale, yes. Um, ladies, we're going to have a tea party on April twenty fourth. I have a sign up sheet for you to bring something, and I'll leave it on the table in the back. Check it out and see if you can provide something for the two It's a really special event for us ladies. We dress up, we have high tea, we enjoy each other's company, and we have a little bit of entertainment. So please, ladies, come. And that includes young ladies, too. It's not yes, just, yes. Uh, Mothers everybody. and daughters, yes, all, everyone. All young daughters and okay. everything. Saturday, all April 24th at 11 or what? 11. 11 o'clock. Okay, cool. That's great. Got a few more Sundays to get that in there. Now I remember another reason why I had these. Okay, yesterday we had our women's luncheon, and um, what we do on our, uh, when Ron and I and Joseph go traveling and evangelizing, we put
promise scriptures on these three by five cards and then we can hand them to people for encouragement and leave them around. So if any of you would like to be involved in that, I've got a whole bunch of these cards. If you want to see me afterwards and you can put uh, promise scriptures on here, they're all throughout the Bible. So that would be great. Okay? In April. Praise God. Okay, so birthdays. We have birthdays. Yay, absolutely cool. And the wolves are gone, as you can see, but uh, Joy's is tomorrow, so that's cool. And Sandy Ralph, she's trying to hide. Yay! (laughs) (laughs) All right. Praise God. Okay. And Alexis, Alexis Ada back there. Yay, Alexis. (laughs) Woo hoo! All right. And uh, Kat. Cat Hardy, they're not here today. That's Nate and Cat and you know Ezekiel and all those guys. So <laughs> pray for them. That's that'll be good. Okay, let's sing happy birthday to the ones that are here. Happy birthday to you. To Jesus be true. May God's richest blessings now. And then any anniversaries we might have missed for this week? Nope. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. Now we have a special number. Right? Okay. And do you want to do offering during this number? No. He said no. Can you hear me from here? I have to see the word. Can you hear me from here, June? Can you hear me? No? Okay. You can hear me when I say Okay. <coughs> oh. So while she's getting that together, i got to tell you what. This week um, was God was there. Um, I had to ask the prayer group to please pray because I was being harassed by some drunks. And um, they were camping in the property next to mine. And um, I was fearful. And what does God say? Fear not, for I am with you. And they started praying. I'll tell you what. I could tell the angels of the Lord were encamped around me because I had power. I knew I had power. And I stood at my window with all the lights off, and I prayed against them. And it was the moonlit night. Hello, I could see everything. And um, I was praying that they would see the angels, and you could hear them. It got quieter and quieter. And they went to sleep. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was no way those men could do anything to me ever because the angels of the Lord encamp around those who are his. Amen. And um, uh, fear not. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Woo-hoo. Praise the Lord. Okay, praise God. All right. It's our turn. It's our turn.
Jesus. Father, we believe 
believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back again. We believe. Yes, we believe. Let our faith be more than anthem. Greater than the songs we sing. In our weakness and temptation, we believe. We believe. We believe in God's Father. The lost be found and the dead be raised. Here and now they shall be made. The church lived out our God will say we believe. We believe. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. The power of God is sworn to fail. Knowing though your love will never fail. We believe. We believe. We believe in God the Father. to us, Lord, as we mentioned earlier, and you give us everything that we have, Lord. You provide for us, you give us the ability to work with our hands, and you give us the jobs that we need, and you give us everything that we need, Lord, and we're so grateful to you, and we pray for the work of the church, that every man, woman, and child would come to know you personally as their Lord and Savior, from one end of the valley to the other, and you would use each one of us here. Uh, your people to spread that good news, that gospel message. So we are we're grateful, Lord, for this building. We're grateful for this place to gather. We're grateful for the freedom that we have to gather. And Lord, we're, we're grateful for our health this morning and uh, everything that you bless us with. So we're just thankful, Lord. So we're uh, really blessed to be a part of your work, Father, things that you're doing. So we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh 
God is good. Yes, and all the time, God is good. I'd like for you guys to pray for us tonight as we go to uh, the gospel mission and pray for Robert tonight. He's going to share his testimony at the gospel mission tonight as we minister there. Uh, we'll be doing uh, their, their Sunday evening Bible class, and, and we usually bring the bluegrass music, so it's real they like it when we come, and but we try to bring somebody to give a testimony too, and I think it's going to be a great night there tonight, and I appreciate you guys' prayers for us tonight. So let's just pray as we look at God's word this morning. Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord. We thank you that you're here with us, and we just ask that your anointing would be upon your word and your blessing be upon your word today, and Lord, we want our hearts and our eyes and our whole beings to be focused on you this morning, Jesus. You are the author and finisher of our faith. You are the one that takes care of us. You're the one that breathes life into us. And we just thank you that you're here with us. We invite you, Holy Spirit, just to take over everything that's done here now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we're coming to a crescendo in a study of our book of Ephesians here this morning. And it's exciting, it's an exciting crescendo. We're going to be talking about uh, spiritual warfare this morning as he comes into the last part of chapter 6 and verses 10 on through. We got that far. I just want to give you a little recap of what we've learned uh, up to date today. Uh, and, and, the, and the things that God shows us in this uh, letter to the uh, church in Ephesus is really a great great time that we've learned here today. So the first three chapters told us of the great spiritual riches that we have through Jesus Christ. I don't know, you know, we needed to hear that. We needed to know how rich we are in Christ. I really I believe that. Uh, we have become adopted as his sons. We have become accepted in the beloved. We found, we found redemption through Jesus Christ and that is through the forgiveness of our sins. Through faith in Christ, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now in Christ Jesus, we who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Thank you, Lord. We are no longer strangers or foreigners, 
but fellow citizens with the saints and members now of the household of God. How does it feel to be a member of the household of God? Awesome. Then in chapter 4 through 6, we were told how we were to conduct ourselves as those who are born again in the Spirit of God. Paul instructed us to walk as children of light in all goodness and righteousness and truth. He told us to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. He told us that the sinful deeds of the flesh should not even be named among the church. We were told to put off the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of our minds. We were told to live our lives for God, to walk in holiness and purity. Praise the Lord. To speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. Then we were told to honor God in our marriages, husbands and wives, to love and respect each other as Christ loved the church. Christians were told to show honor and respect to their parents. And the children, uh, the parents were to teach their children in love and patience, not provoking them to anger. The final exhortation we have now is in, in chapter 6, verse 10. Would you turn your Bibles there with me if you haven't already, and we'll read through the rest of this chapter here. So, chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always in all prayers and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an, an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as though I ought to speak, but that you may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tiatius, a brother, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all, with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Joseph, can you just turn off the monitors? It's like uh, too much. Thank you. All right. So we, we see we're starting to look at this. The first thing we need to realize is that uh, we have a spiritual enemy. And, you know, that's, that's a realization that we need to understand. When you become a child of God, you not only become God's people, but you also become Satan's enemy as well. And we do have an enemy. The Lord's enemy is our enemy. Our enemy is the Lord's enemy. And the Lord's enemy is Satan, whose purpose is to destroy his works. And John 8, 44, if you wouldn't mind turning over there, in John 8, 44 in your Bibles, Jesus, speaking to a group of Pharisees, gives a brief description of Satan and his purposes. And you know, you guys, as we study this, passage of scripture there's been 
a lot of books written on, on this particular passage of scripture. But I'm just, and, you know, there's a, so much to say about it. To cover this passage of scripture in just this short amount of time, we're going we're gonna to touch base with the basics of it. But hopefully it'll be the basics that will encourage and uh, help us to understand how to fight against the enemy. And so he says, uh, the first thing we need to do is think about what Jesus said. Jesus speaking to a group of Pharisees, and he says this uh, in the description of Satan. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Okay, so what does it tell us about Satan there? We know he's a murderer from the very beginning. He doesn't speak the truth. He's a liar. Okay, and that's how he'll come to you in your lives with those kind of things, bringing lies. Also in John 10.10, 10, we see a description, the purpose of Satan. In John chapter 10, verse 10, uh, Satan contrasted with the purpose of God. We see the purpose of Satan contrasted with the purpose of God. The purpose of Satan, he says, the thief, he calls him the thief, describing the devil, does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But the purpose of Christ, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. And so we see the contrast there, but we see the purpose of the enemy is to kill, maim, and destroy. Now Jesus came in order to destroy the works of the devil. In 1 John chapter 3, go there with me, 1 John chapter 3. Verse 8. And he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. One of the purposes that Jesus came for was to destroy the works of the devil. So uh, what is, you know, we have a question here about Satan. His, what is Satan's influence over people who are unsaved? What is his influence over the saved people? And what is his influence over nations? I'm just going to touch briefly on this because I want to get to the meat of uh, the last part of that chapter there. But first off, Satan is the deceiver. He's the deceiver. One aspect of Satan's work is to corrupt all that God has created, attempting to destroy everything that God's created. So Satan's work is contrast to God's work. Jesus helps while Satan hinders. So remember what we just read in John 10.10. 10. So Satan is the deceiver. Uh, Satan comes deceiving the nations. Today we see much of Satan's energies are directed against the nations of the world, deceiving the nations of the world. We know at his second coming of Christ, when Jesus returns, Satan will be sealed up in a pit, and he will, he, that he should deceive the nations no more, Revelation 3, uh, 20, verse 3. But right now, he has freedom to perform his deceptive works among the nations. And we, we could talk about that a lot, couldn't we? How we see the influence of Satan in the nations. But in the future, Satan will convince the nations to support his cause to come into the great battle of Armageddon where he's going to lead the nations to their ultimate destruction at that point in time. There's much to be said about this subject, but we just want to see how it's, uh, he's involved in deceiving the nations a little bit. Deceiving the unsaved. Satan is aggressively at work trying to uh, keep the gospel, keep the unsaved people from understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. He tries uh, to steal the good word that is planted in people's hearts as well. So even when people have get the good word, the enemy comes in and tries to steal the good word. Remember the parable of the sower and the seed in Luke 8, 12. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, 
then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So he's at work even trying to deter, the, he's at work trying to deter the work of God. And when people have a good word, they hear the good word, he's right there trying to steal that back out of their hearts. Now in the book of Acts, we see a lot of uh, uh, account, one account after another, how the devil used men to oppose the, the preaching of the gospel. As the gospel went out, there was constant opposition to the preaching of the gospel. So Satan's strategy is really simple. If he can prevent men from hearing the gospel and understanding what Christ offers them, then men will be content to go their own way. And that's pretty much what's happening in the world today. Proverbs 16.25 says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so people have their own views. They have their own ideas. But what they really need to have is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to have the good news. But as we see, there's a great opposition. Satan's plot, he also has a plot to defeat those who are saved. That would be you and me. He comes against us. Uh, this attempt that he makes to defeat the saved has got, got to be very frustrating for the enemy. Because he cannot really destroy the child of God. He can kill and destroy the body, but in this he loses because the believer's soul is going to be victoriously into heaven with Christ. So he loses there. But what he'll try to do is Satan will try to come in and he'll use the lust of the flesh, he'll use the lust of the eyes, and he'll use the pride of life to try to get us to turn away from Christ and turn back into the world. And 1 John 2, 5 through 5 and 16 talks about that. Maybe we should read that. Let's go ahead and read that. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the, lo the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. And so there's that temptation of the world that's constantly being thrown at us to try to get us to go the ways of the world, go back into the world, maybe even go back into our own old ways. Now he will directly or indirectly attack. If Satan can get a person to turn back to uh, turn, back, turn their back on God and yield to sin, of course, he's going to get, get the advantage of that person. Once in a while, a Christian may stumble, but the Bible says in Proverbs 24, 16, a just man falls seven times and rises up again. Praise the Lord. If God is for us, who can be against us? When you and I do fall, and we do at times in our lives, uh, 1 John 1, 9 applies. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So we do have an advocate with the Father. If we blow it, we can come to Christ, we can ask for forgiveness, we can confess our sins, and he will forgive us and cleanse us of our sins once again. So we can't defeat the devil in our flesh in our own strength. But with the power of God who lives in us, we have the victory over him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Think about that for a minute. And I know you guys have heard that verse uh, quite a bit. You are of God, little children. First off, we belong to God. We are his property. He purchased and paid for each one of us with a great price. He gave his life for us. And we've overcome because he has overcome. Because our sins are forgiven because he has overcome death. He overcame that. He rose from the dead on the third day. Praise God. And because of that we've overcome. And because he is in us, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Praise God. We have this enemy that's always after us. But we also have somebody in us that's more powerful. 
we have the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in us, right? So Kate, Satan cannot destroy the Christian, but he can tempt the Christian to sin. Now, he has been successful at this in times past. Uh, he tempted Ananias and Sapphira to lie to the apostles in after Acts chapter 5, 3. Remember, they went and sold. They were selling all their possessions, and they came to the foot of uh, Peter, and they said, hey, what's, you know, what have you done? And they lied. And so he's tempted. he tempts people to lie. He's called the accuser of the brethren, Revelation 12.10. He seeks to hinder Christians in their work for God, 1 Thessalonians 2.18. I don't have time to go through all these scriptures. I'm just trying to give you a basic view here of what he does. But he seeks to hinder Christians in their work for God, 1 Thessalonians 2.18. He seeks to defeat Christians in their walk with God, Ephesians 6.18. So Satan will attempt to destroy the church even sometimes by bringing in unsaved members who he may plant in the church to cause division within the body of Christ, or he may bring unsaved teachers into the church to try to teach false doctrines and heresies. 2 Corinthians 11:15 and 13 through 15. If he cannot destroy the church through internal opposition, he will use external persecution against the Christians and we see that's happening all over the world today in different countries, in Sudan and in uh, parts of Asia where Christians are being persecuted, they're being killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. He couldn't get to them any other way because they were standing strong in their belief for God, so he came at the direct attack, burning churches, killing Christians, uh, and, and horrendous things. He is merciless, by the way. Uh, now, now, let's take a look here now. Go back over to Ephesians for a minute. I just kind of give you a little outline there of the enemy and some of his strategies. I could tell you stories that would curl your hair, and I wish I had time to do that. But I, I just want to go through this chapter here. And so we see uh, first thing we need to know back in chapter 6, verse 10, that Satan is a fallen angel. He was created by God. He is in no way superior to God. So don't ever get the idea that he is more powerful than God. He has deceived people to think that. And he has people following him that believe that. But believers have the power of the indwelling resurrected Christ in their lives, protecting us from the snares and, and forces of the enemy. We have that in our lives. 1 John 4.4 4 says again, You are uh, little children. You are God, little children, if you have, you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So we know that he is in us. If we receive Christ, we have the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in us, living in us. So in verse 14, he says, Stand, having girded your waist with truth. He begins to talk about ways that we can stand up against the devil. Okay, your waist... Uh, or your loins speak of a personal area of one's life, okay? Believers have, have to hold a personal commitment to truth. We have to realize how important truth is. And there is only one truth, and that's the truth of the Word of God. So the private life of the spiritual man should be surrounded by truth. We should have truth reigning in our life. Uh, we do well to put away lying, for lying is nothing more than a snare of the devil. And the devil will try to get us to go there as much as he can. Okay? But really, guys, in our Christian walk, the safest place to be in our Christian walk is on the front lines of the battlefield. That's the safest place to be. Because there we're about God's business. We're about doing God's work. We're not sitting idle and being so much tempted by temptations and things that may come in toward us. Okay, so the front lines of the battlefield is the place to be because there we're focused on serving God. And Jesus overcomes Satan. He overcame Satan in the temptation in the wilderness when he began to speak what? The word of God back, right? He began to quote the scripture and he overcame the enemy by quoting the scripture. 
So really today there's only one truth, and that is Jesus Christ and his word. Okay? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So gird yourself with the word of God. Gird yourself up. Our, our, it's, a, it's a weapon. We're going to talk about that. It's one of our weapons that he's given us. He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. And this breastplate in battle was to protect the vital organs because they wore it over the, their chest to protect the vital organs. The breastplate is also generally thought of as a place of the soul. So the heart must be kept pure and righteous because sin gives a foothold to the enemy. You know, the enemy is always coming after us in all kinds of different ways, trying to get in there. So we have to keep our hearts pure and righteous. And if we don't do that, then the enemy has a foothold. When we sin, the Holy Spirit will convict us of our sin. And this is a healthy thing for us, actually. We, we count on the Holy Spirit's conviction in our lives because he keeps us on the, on the right path, you know. He keeps us going the right directions. Uh, the devil is always going to try to bring condemnation upon us, to condemn us. He attacks the emotions of the heart. And we need to recognize the difference between condemnation and conviction. There is a big difference. Condemnation causes us to run away from God, but conviction draws us closer to God. Condemnation says, well, you know, what? what's the use? You know, and just stop praying, stop going to church, and stop reading the word of God, because the devil will come in and he'll say, you know, you're worthless. You're no good. You're not worthy. You blow it. And you know, the best thing you can do when the devil tells you that and the devil comes at me and says that, and says, Ron, you know what? You're not worthy, you're no good. I can just say to the devil, you know what? I understand that. I said, you know, I'm not worthy. I am no good. But the old Ron died. And God brought back to life a new Ron. And the new Ron's a different person. I no longer walk in the flesh, but now I walk in the spirit, right? Walk in the spirit. And I walk in his righteousness and not my own righteousness. I walk in his power, and so I, see, I can say, get behind me, Satan. Because I'm not operating in my own power and authority, I'm operating in his power and authority. And that's where we need to be with Christ. Having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Having our feet shod with the, the gospel of peace means we don't walk on people. We don't get, to, but we do get to share the gospel with people. The gospel means good news. We get to share good news with people. And that's a good news about Christ, that Christ can bring great peace into people's lives. You know, when we, when someone will really receive the good news about Christ, they can experience peace like they've never experienced before in their life. First off, peace from the forgiveness of sins. And then peace from the indwelling presence of God comes upon the person. And we have this great peace in our lives. So you see, it's our blessing and our privilege to say to those in our path, the good news is today for you that the Lord loves you today. He knows of what you're going through and he can set you free and give you peace in your life. Amen. What a great privilege it is to be able to talk to people about the Lord. So how does this help us to overcome the enemy? Talking, spreading the gospel, having the message of the good news and bringing peace. Well, when we're doing God's work, first off, it helps us to stay focused and heading in the right direction. And se secondly, we march into the battlefield, we take the good news to the lost. And so it helps us to defeat the enemy because God, if God is for us, who can be against us? When God's spirit fills us and we fulfill what he told us to do, God is with us in a great degree. The power of the spirit is there. So he says, take up the shield of faith. How important is that? Without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God, right? Those who come to God must come by faith. By grace, you're saved through faith. So the wicked one is the accuser of the brethren, we found in Revelation 12.10. He, 
he will send his fiery darts to instill doubt and fear and guilt upon a person. He can do that on, he does that all the time with unbelievers, but he also does it with believers. He'll shoot those fiery doubts upon you to bring uh, fiery arrows upon you to try to bring doubt, fear, and guilt into your life. But faith acts as an invisible shield that deflects such accusations. The shield of faith. It's like an invisible shield. Hebrews 11.6 talks about our shield of faith. Also, faith overcomes the enemy as by faith we stand on the promises of God and we quote those things back to the devil. We quote the word of God back to the devil. How important is this to plant the word of God in your heart? Wow. Without the word of God in your heart, you don't have much defense against the enemy. When he comes to you with these lies... You don't have any way to defend yourself, but with the word of God. Remember, Jesus spoke the word of God against the devil when he was tempted in the wilderness. And so he overcame the devil that way. The word of God and the promises of God caused the devil to flee, actually. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. So faith is an important thing. Take the helmet of salvation Now, a helmet protects our head, that is, the brain and the thoughts. And one of our greatest battlefields that we have is in the mind. Satan will try to attack our minds. You might be just going about your business, and all of a sudden, the enemy will throw this really horrible thought into your mind. Where did that come from, you say? (laughs) I don't want that. You may be laying in bed, and the thought comes in. Where did that come from? Well, it's the enemy It's his uh, tactics, you know. But the helmet protects the head, and that's the brain and the thoughts. So assurance of salvation is a mighty defense against Satan's false accusations. We are assured of our salvation. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. If you think you can come in to the kingdom of heaven in any other way except through the Son, you're mistaken. There's only one way. And that's through Jesus Christ. And so he who has the Son has life and he who has not the Son has not life. It would be an important thing to have the Son, to believe and put your faith in Jesus Christ, receive him into your heart as your Lord and Savior. So take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is one of our weapons. We have two main weapons to fight the enemy. We have the Word of God and we have prayer. Two very powerful, important weapons that we've been given by God. Now Jesus used these weapons against the enemy. He gives us that uh, whole picture of his temptation in Luke 4, 1 through 13. And, you know, I think the reason why Jesus went through that mountain of temptation there was for an example for us. Because, you know, he knew that we would go through the same things. You know, once we became his people, once we believed in him, it became his children, the children of God. We would go through these temptations like he went through. We would go through these spiritual battles. So he showed us how to overcome the enemy by quoting the word of God. The word of God needs to always be in our heart and in our minds and and on our lips all the time, day and night. So the word is living and powerful and is effective as a weapon against the enemy. And Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It is a discerner, of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God does a lot of things. The word of God is our main weapon against the enemy, but it also brings life to us, keeps us on the right course, keeps us in the right direction. 
because it's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. If we get off course, if we go the wrong direction, the word of God will bring us back on the right course and show us which way to go. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that definitely includes the spiritual battlefield, guys. Definitely includes that spiritual battlefield that we're in, that we go through. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We've been given these spiritual weapons. It's the word of God. It's the spirit of God. It's the power of God. That we can come against the devil and he has to flee. That's why they say speak the name of Jesus and the enemy has to go. But speak the name of Jesus and use the word of God. You know, speak to him what Jesus says. Quote the scripture. And he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So prayer opens up channels between us and God, actually. Prayer is our communication link with God. In the midst of the battle, we as believers must keep constant communication with our leader so we can have directions and encouragement in our life. We need to keep that communication line open all the time because God wants to lead us by his Holy Spirit. He wants to guide us and lead us by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. We need to be able to hear his Spirit so that we can walk in the Spirit. We need to be able to get those directions from God. Prayer is that. Prayer does that for us. We can hear God. We can uh, fellowship with God through prayer. We can commune with God through prayer. So James tells us that our prayers for one another are very important. And you know, it's so true because we all need prayer constantly. We're in this battle. We're, in, we're the body of Christ. We're in this together. We are a family of God. We all need prayer. So we pray all the time for everyone here. We try to pray for all the people in the church all the time. And, and we know that you pray for us because we can sense your prayers. We, we know your prayers are with us. And I can tell you stories about how your prayers have opened doors and how your prayers have, have helped us through things in our life. You don't know how many times the enemy has tried to get me to so discouraged that I would quit being a pastor of the church. I've been here 27 years. And there's been numerous, numerous times that he's tried to get me to go do something else. But really, God has called me to serve him and, and nobody but him. And where can we go but to Jesus anyway? Really. <laughs> there's no place else to go. But James 5.16 it says, uh, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Philippians and 1 Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing and everything by prayer and supplication. You know, prayer should be an ongoing conversation between you and God all the time. Not just, well, we've got to stop everything and pray or we're going to set aside... A, a set apart a time to pray those are good things too but the prayer should be just a constant communication link between you and and the lord and we should just be in that involved in that continuously all the time so prayer moves the heart of god and prayer drives back the enemy praise god prayer is a powerful weapon against the enemy but let me give you the key to the victory that we have in this battle right now the key to our spiritual victory is we are to be strong in the power of his might not our might no not us we're to be strong in the power of his might and that's in jesus christ you see it's all wrapped up in jesus it's all about jesus okay he is the truth john fourteen six. 
He is our breastplate of righteousness, Romans 13, 13. He guides our feet in peace, Luke 1, 79. He is our shield. He's the shield of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. He is the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2, 10. He is the word made flesh, John 1, 14. You see, it's all wrapped up in Jesus as we realize that we stand strong in the power of his might. You know, I am weak, but he is strong. We stand strong in the power of Christ's might. I can't come up against these battles, these spiritual battles, these principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places without Christ being between me and the enemy. We need to put him in front so he can go for the battle, you know. And, and without that, we're, we're trying to do it in our own strength and our own effort, and the enemy's going to beat us up every time. But when he sees Christ there, when he knows that we're not coming in our own strength and our own power, we're coming in the power of God, that changes everything. And that makes everything right. Because then he, he can't stand up against Christ. So he has to go the other direction. My prayer for you today, guys, uh, let's just have a prayer today. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I pray for the body of Christ here today. I, I pray that you would help each one to be able to stand strong in the power of your might, Lord. Lord, that we would be so close to you and so Christ-centered in our thoughts, our lives, our actions, that we would be constantly in prayer, communing with you, being guided by your Spirit. Lord, that the enemy would have no opportunity to take advantage, that our thoughts would be upon your word. And whatsoever things are good and, and lovely and a good report, think upon these things, you sold us. And your word is all those things. Your word is life. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so, Father, as we meditate upon you day and night, as we meditate upon your word day and night, we know that your word instills in our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. And you give us power over the enemy. And we give it, you give us the victory through your mighty name, through the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And, Father God, we just pray that you strengthen us, each one, because we know the attacks will come. We know that the enemy's out there right now like a roaring lion sinking who he may devour. And he's, he doesn't discriminate. He wants to take out God's people as well, your people as well, Lord. And so we're just praying that you would strengthen us, that you would always be close to us, Lord, in such a way that the enemy would not be able to sneak around and have, take advantage of us, Father. And we just ask that you would help us to be there for one another as well. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. And Father, we just thank you for this day. And we just ask that you would just fully fill us with your spirit this morning. And so we go from this place, we would not go with your, from your presence. And if you're here today and you don't really know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I think today is the day to uh, invite Christ into your life. Today is the day of salvation. So would you all stand? I want to give you guys, if maybe that's you here today, I want to give you an uh, opportunity to receive Christ and, and ha ask him into your heart. We have a direction guideline for this in Romans 10, 9. It says, if we, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Without the Lord, we are defenseless in, in this spiritual battle. We have to have the Lord, we have to have the indwelling presence of the Lord in our hearts, in our lives, the indwelling presence of God the Holy Spirit to abide in us. And without that, we are defenseless against the attacks of the enemy. So I encourage you to pray and invite Christ into your heart today. Invite Christ in your heart today. And let him be there in you. Let him be your Lord and Savior. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lead you in a prayer. And if you'd like to pray, would you pray with me? And say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus thank, you for loving me. thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me right where I'm at. 
I believe in you. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you did pray that prayer this morning and you invited Christ in your heart for the first time, would you come up and just talk with me after the service this morning and let me pray with you this morning. You guys have a blessed day and just have a blessed week, okay? God bless all you guys.